Greetings, welcome everyone. I know people are joining, um, can, making their connection. Uh, welcome. Uh, I think we'll get started. Um, so my name is Caitlin McCaffrey. I'm the International Program Director at the Centre for Policy and Development, and I'll be your facilitator uh, for today's webinar. I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which I live and work and where I'm joining you from today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to elders past and present and particularly any Indigenous people joining us on the webinar today. Today's session is brought to you by the Australian International Development Network, uh, or Aiden. Uh, Aiden's mission is to facilitate more and better international giving and investing from Australians to overseas communities. They do this through a range of activities, including webinars like this one, to raise awareness of critical issues within the international development sector. Now, as most of you will know, today marks three years since the military coup in Myanmar overturned the democrat democratically elected civilian government. During that time, almost 4,500 people have been killed, almost 26,000 arrested, and millions have been internally and externally displaced due to the military's actions. Uh, so today we're here not only to discuss some of the suffering um, of the last three years, uh, but I thought the title of the webinar was very aptly Resistance Amidst Turmoil. And indeed, the resistance movement um, has really been unprecedented. Uh, it's currently estimated to exercise control over around half of the country, including some significant territorial gains even over the last three months. So there are, have been some causes for hope, and I hope we can get further into those during today's discussion. Uh, so today I'm joined by three people really expertly qualified to go into these issues and many more. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Sean Turnell, uh, author, economist, and former policy advisor to the Myanmar government, Manny Mong, my Myanmar researcher at Human Rights Watch, and Tasneem Rock, campaign manager at the Myanmar Campaign Network. Uh, so just before we get started, a small bit of housekeeping. Um, I believe the chat um, uh, function is open, um, as is the Q&A box for you all to use and log any questions or comments um, throughout the session. And we really encourage you to use both um, throughout the conversation so that we can make it interactive. Um, I think uh, Emily's been, uh, will be posting um, the bios of all our panelists in more detail in the chat. Uh, and finally, we're also recording this session and it'll be published on Aiden's website and YouTube channel uh, in the coming days for anyone who wasn't able to attend live today. Uh, so I think that's all the housekeeping. Um, so I thought we'd start today uh, just with one question for all three of you. And Sean, I'll go to you first. Um, but really, I think th today, three years on from the coup, I'd love to hear how would you describe the current state of play in Myanmar and maybe particularly given the recent developments in the last three months? Thanks so much, Caitlin, for the question. Um, and thank you to you and everyone at Aiden the opportunity to talk to everyone today on this very important day, as you said. Um, well, so I guess I, I'm here to talk about the economy. That, that That's the area where I feel I have at least a degree of competence. Um, so I might just talk about the state of play there. Uh, and just to say at the outset, of course, it's awful. It's dreadful. Um, and I think we're going to hear more from Taz and, and Manny in particular about just, you know, the damage done to the country, of which the economic is just a part. Um, but, you know, to stick for the economy at the moment, I guess what I did want to highlight, if we're looking at Myanmar now, we can say that it is no longer a transition economy. So we often use that expression that Myanmar is a transition economy, a uh, transition country, with, I guess, the assumption that it's moving on some sort of growth and development trajectory. That, that That's, you know, how we typically look at a country like Myanmar, and ever, particularly ever since about 2010. Uh, and then accelerating, of course, when the NLD got into office in 2016. That that was the sort of use, usual scenario. We have to set that aside now. Uh, Myanmar is a war economy. And to the extent that the SAC junta has any economic policy making uh, at all, philosophy, if you like, although I wouldn't use a grand word like that for it, um, it's really nothing but to secure as much resources, real and financial, for their war efforts. So it really is a war economy. 
Um, there was an old expression that Lenin used way back, you know, in the Russian Revolution called war communism, which was basically the military just let loose on the country to grab whatever they could. And, and that seems to me to be the, the vision that we should have in terms of the economic policies uh, of, of this, this current junta. Um, so all of that means, I think, that our assumptions, our presumptions about this current regime have to be set aside uh, compared to our thinking in the past. So this is not the pre-NLD uh, Van Sane government. It's not even the, the Than Shui government. It's not a regime that uh, has anything in mind except the extraction of resources for itself, as, as I mentioned. So in other words, there's no cost, it seems to me, that they're willing not to pay on behalf of the people to to secure their own efforts. So, uh, you know, it... it they, they don't particularly care about the damage that's done to the civilian economy. And the, and the reason why I want to highlight that too, that as consistent with this idea of a war economy, is that when we talk about some other things, some actions of outside players such as sanctions and so on in particular, I think we have to bear that in mind. If we're thinking about things like sanctions and other policies like that, it's not about shaming this regime. It's not about trying to get them to change their behaviour. For them, the issues are existential. So what we have to do when we think of policies against this regime to try and change outcomes in Myanmar is how to reduce their capacity, how to reduce their capabilities. And here, we naturally then drift into the area of foreign exchange, access to foreign military equipment, munitions, etc., the air, air force capacity that is the only real advantage they have over the opposition. So we need to be thinking about things like sanctions as to the extent that they inhibit this sort of activity. So, yeah, so this designation, as I say, of something being a war economy rather than anything else, I think is important then when we need to think of our reactions as well. Uh, just as a brief tangent of this, and I think Taz uh, in particular is going to say more about this, is that welcome today the decision of the Australian government to sanction the Myanmar Investment and Commercial Bank and the uh, Myanmar Foreign Trade Bank brilliant. Uh, these institutions are very important in the way that the SAC junta has been able to access uh, foreign uh, uh, foreign exchange to buy the military equipment, etc. Much more needs to be done. Uh, Myanmar Economic Bank also needs to be sanctioned. But anyway, welcome what they've done so far. Likewise for their sanctioning on, on the jet fuel. Um, final thing just to say, uh, I don't want to hold the proceedings. The other, the other thing just to say in terms of the present picture, I'm greatly impressed by the economic policies of the team around the NUG, not just the NUG, but the whole opposition movement. They put out a brilliant document yesterday about federal, uh, a democratic federal system, uh, but likewise the economic policies that I've been privy to that have come to, to add to that, to complement that, just so impressive. So I'll end my little thing just by saying I'm quite confident at the moment, this snapshot at the moment, that the uh, the 2024 will hold out something better. Oh, thanks, Sean. What a positive way to start um, start the session today. And I'd love to get more into the, the NUG and opposition policies a bit later on, I think, in the webinar. Um, but Manny, maybe over to you next. Um, what would be your, yeah, your reflections, the same question on um, where we're at at the moment? Thanks, Caitlin. I'm sorry, my internet is playing up, so I, I may cut out at some point. Um, look, I think it's Sean is correct. We're really at a breakthrough moment. And I think that a lot of us, um, after three years of quite um, horrific, you know, news day in, day out, we, we're feeling a bit more buoyed about the aspects of this. Um, and why we, we're at this point place and time actually is really down to the people of Myanmar and the people inside Myanmar who are continuing to resist in whatever form that may be. And I don't mean just in armed conflict. You know, there are still people who are taking part in um, CDM. There are still people who are, you know, taking great risks to their own lives to try and facilitate and help get aid in and out of places that are very, very hard to reach. Um, we've also seen um, a really, really big success in military campaigns, <clears throat> excuse me, from some of the ethnic armed groups. And I think this has really, um, you know, rallied a lot of the, the PDF and other, other fighters around the country, but also just within the people themselves. Um, there's a bit of a shift and we're seeing political pressure um, on men online from, you know, 
factions where there were natural support, like with the uh, nationalist monks and, and things. So I think we really need to capitalize on this and build on that pressure. So I do think that some of these um, long vision sanctions are working in some ways, um, but certainly there's there's a lot more need to be need to be done. Um, so right now, unfortunately, from the human rights perspective, um, you know, Volga Turk, the U UN. Um, High Commissioner for Human Rights has said that the country in terms of the human rights outlook is in free fall. And this is where I'm really, really concerned about because we do need to look at mechanisms that will stop the military being able to continue committing abuses. And that's key. Yeah, thanks so much, Manny. Um, and Taz, um, what would be your, I guess, summary after those two? Um... Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, well, obviously, echoing um, what uh, Sean and Manny have both said in terms of feeling positive about this year, certainly um, those strategic kind of wins that the anti-junta and pro-democracy forces have had in the last three months, I think it's buoyed all of us. Um, and so, so that's really exciting. Um, was really pleased this morning uh, to to hear. I was uh, I was in in the car rushing to the airport to to come to Melbourne, um, but yeah, found out about the sanctions, and I was really um, really happy about that. And um, yeah, also uh, agree as well. You know, it's a significant step that um, is crucial to to shutting down or or cutting the the hunters. Um, capacity to to commit these atrocities, but again, it's it's not enough. And look, I have to be really honest. <laughs> I'm going to be really honest with you. You know, are we going to wait a year for ne the next sanctions? I I really want this to be the beginning of a series of sanctions that are truly effective in cutting off the the hunters' financial resources. And I don't want it to be retrospective. Do you know what I mean? You know, two years, five years, too late. Telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thanks, Taz. Um, I wonder um, just uh, in terms of sort of the situation inside the country um, at the moment, to go into a little bit more detail perhaps, because I know a lot of the um, people joining the webinar, a lot of people work with um, humanitarian agencies and others working on the ground um, uh, in Myanmar at the moment. Um, so maybe... Um, this one might be for you, Manny, um, around, I guess, what kind of are the main human rights concerns, I guess, that that, that Human Rights Watch has um, currently. Uh, and I guess um, in terms of the humanitarian response, um, is there, yeah, more that can be done in that space as well? Okay, I'm going to take a, a leaf out of Tether's book <laughs> and be very honest. <laughs> It's disappointing. I mean, obviously, okay, let me let me give you a bit of a snapshot about the human human rights perspective. Um, it's worse. It has not improved. And you can bet your bottom dollar that it is even worse for the Rohingya who remain living in apartheid conditions in Myanmar, as well as for the Rohingya who are still stuck in Bangladesh. And, um, you know, if you can imagine the outlook for refugees right now who are stuck in a no-go, um, no-move area, they have no freedom of movement, no opportunities, no livelihoods, it's it's horrific. Um, but also the situation for the Rohingya really is a, you know, bodes really terribly ill for them because um, they do feel forgotten. And this is up to us to try and really push through um, what they're trying to achieve inside at an international platform. Um, you know, it's it's three years. Um, yes, three years too long. And I'm really, really glad to see the Australian government uh, taking some stronger action. But there are loopholes in these sanctions that they have imposed. Um, they sanction Burmese entities, but no foreign entities. And again, with the uh, jet fuel sanctions, only Canada is the um, Canada is the only country that has imposed comprehensive sanctions. Um, but again, I want to return back to this discussion about the war economy. So you know, three years, five years, three years later, the entire country has been forced to take part in the war economy. 
So whereas three years ago we were discussing, you know, peaceful protests, um, strike action, and other non-violent means in which people could protest. Three years of neglect from the international community has forced people into a situation now where there is something like 2 million people internally displaced. Um, just in the last three months alone, about 600,000 more displaced. Um, daily attacks, airstrikes that are targeting civilians uh, multiple times, not just once or twice, people are fleeing seven, eight, nine, ten times, and um, this is all over the country. So the situation is such that it is, yes, in free fall, but I am hoping that this is the worst that it gets, particularly since everyone hates men online now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Manny. And just maybe staying, yeah, staying on the, the war economy, I guess, um, Sean, we're already getting some great questions, um, by the way, in the chat, everybody. Uh, but someone's asked about um, uh, the support of China to the military, I guess, as well. And I think, yeah, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on that dynamic. They've asked specifically um, in relation to the recent crackdowns on the online scam centres, but I guess the relationship in general would be interesting to discuss a bit as well economically yeah i mean just on that the, the sort of online scams the the economy that has grown up there up on the chinese border um i mean it's the one part of myanmar's economy that has been growing right the illicit economy the old narcotics section the traditional one myanmar is now once again the world's largest exporter of opium to the world um so all of that is going gangbusters but yeah all these other areas of illegal activity uh, is there and and that's worrying the Chinese. So the Chinese are are really caught in a dilemma. I think um, on the one hand, uh, you know, the, the last thing they want is a vibrant democracy next to them, uh, and which is one of the reasons why they in the background. And I think this is a story that never got out properly enough. Actually, their hostility to the uh, democratic government from 2016 2021. There was a weird, in fact, counter narrative that seemed to develop that somehow the NLD were pro China, which is just you know, they, they were pro Myanmar, they weren't pro China, and the Chinese were pissed off basically from one end to the other. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so you know, China doesn't want a vibrant democracy next to them. Uh, but uh, so you know, perhaps they they wouldn't have not welcomed the coup, but they also want stability. Um, they've got huge investments in, in Myanmar, they were desperate at one point. It's a little bit unclear now because they're starting to run out of money themselves. They were desperate to build these vast projects for the BRI. Uh, the NLD government really pushed back on those uh, and reduced them substantially. Uh, the SAC regime has made it clear, you know, and again, despite all the protest protestations of them being the upholders of Myanmar's sovereignty and all that, um, have, you know, signaled to China many times that they're open to reconsider these projects, but the Chinese themselves seem to be a little bit reluctant. Um, again, perhaps it's the money, but more so, I think, is that Myanmar is not a place that offers security to Chinese investment. So I think the Chinese have sort of got the tiger by the tail a little bit here in that, you know, that they've, they've got a, a government in many other ways that they've welcomed. But uh, it's just clear that Minong Lai and his pals have just lost control. This is not a stable environment. It's not anymore any sort of stable place in which you can access resources and all that. It's certainly not a market for their goods as Myanmar just descends deeper and deeper into poverty. Then you've got the scam centres of which the principal victims, mostly Chinese, but of course many uh, in the West and so on, America, Australia, etc. as well. So, you know, Myanmar has just reverted to its place as being a pariah um, I think the only countries that, that parallel it now are, I guess, Iran or North Korea. I mean, that, that that's back where it is. And so, yeah, I would imagine China's quite discombobulated um, about events, basically. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly that situation's gone. The pariah status has returned, really, when you think about it. Um, uh, I guess, speaking of... Um, uh, investments in Myanmar, um, and someone's also asked about this in the chat. I know this week, um, Taz, a really big report came out about um, Australian uh, investments in, in Myanmar. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I think it was N Neil in the chat mentioned that um, the 
the benefits that the SAC, the Junta, receives from mining resources. And Sean, I think you also said, you know, the extractive industry is like this big financial lifeline for the Junta. Uh, Justice for Myanmar released uh, a very, very, very comprehensive, well-researched um, dossier, basically, of evidence and found that 10 Australian companies are still active in the in the mining sector in Myanmar. So they're direct, either directly or indirectly, uh, you know, supporting the junta. And so that could be any anywhere from, say, for example, one of the companies named is Cornerstone Resources. They have an active mine. Uh, and then there's other companies that um, either are explore, uh, you know, have exploratory licenses or they're providing other services that are keeping the mining um, sector active. Um, and, you know, based on that, obviously, from our perspective, uh, you know, it's it's uh, and it, it's a reason for an increased call on the Australian government. I mean, our hands are dirty here, right? We we sometimes people say, oh, well, Australians, we don't have much investment in Myanmar. You know, it, what impact will sanctions have? Um, well, one thing they will do is force <laughs> Australian companies to um, to to exit from a, a, a country that um, has horrific human rights issues and, um, you know, and, and atrocity crimes. These companies are supposed to be doing their human rights due diligence and they're clearly not. Um, one of the companies responded said, well, we're not interacting with any um, entities that are sanctioned. Uh, well, not by the Australian government. We, you know, we haven't committed any crimes. So the the recommendations in the report are obviously, well, these companies, you know, should do their, their due diligence and adhere to international uh, guidelines and standards. Uh, they should also consult with the legitimate gov government, the National Unity Government, and um, any ethnic organisations in those areas. And if they find that um, there are human rights uh, risks and abuses, then they should uh, they should responsibly divest. Uh, but in lieu of Australian sanctions, what is going to you know enforce this? Like Australian companies are obviously not doing their human rights due diligence. Um, and uh, there's also the case of uh, Australian companies importing goods, still importing goods into Australia that directly support state-owned enterprises. So we're still importing uh, timber and wood products. We're still import importing pearls and gems. We're still importing arms and ammunition from Myanmar, knowing that these are these are these are going to accounts that are directly under junta control. So the solution, our call is is we need to sanction these state-owned enterprises that are that are funding the Hunter's atrocities. Yeah, thanks, Taz. Um, and actually related, someone's just asked a question in the chat that um, I think Manny, um, you're probably best place to speak to, um, says given the militias having to resort to bombing villages, who's supplying the fuel for the planes? Um, and I know, yeah. <laughs> Um, the the military is bombing, uh, yeah, the villages who's playing. Okay, so um, that's a really great question, actually. Amnesty International's done a fantastic uh, report on it um, that was released just yesterday as well, identifying how some of these um, fuel sanctions are being circumvented by particular countries, and um, they've even managed to uh, map out a supply chain of how it gets into the country. Um, in this particular example, they use how uh, they use an example of uh, Vietnam and how cargo is met, like fuel cargo is going via sanctioned countries into Vietnam and then into Myanmar. So again, actually probably not violating sanctions as such because they're using international companies. Um, the, the fuel itself might not be, you know, jet fuel as such. It's aviation fuel, but then it's getting jerry-rigged at a certain point so that it can be used in jet fuel. Um, so while it's great to have these sanctions come into effect, it's as Sean says, you know, is it really hitting it where it's going to hurt the hip pocket and we're seeing that it's not. So that example again of Canada being the only country to have comprehensive sanctions, we've now got the US, Australia, 
um, UK, um, the EU who have put in sanctions in place, but these are targeted at these Burmese companies, right, being able to do the money transfers in and out of the country. The problem here is that international companies can still do business. And there's something like five companies that are still providing insurance cover for that cargo fuel that's going into Myanmar. So those are these loopholes that we're talking about where we need to make sure that they're closed and that there are consequences for doing that because the issue now is about enforcement. Um, we have had some success where Thailand and uh, particularly Singapore have been um, scared about the banking sanctions and doing transactions in US dollars and EU dollar transactions. And that has stopped them uh, doing further business with companies um, and obviously the banks that are sanctioned by the US. But uh, going forward, I think we need more robust coordination between these concerned countries and really, really seeking um, the ASEAN partners to, to be, you know, enforcing the existing sanctions that are there, including Australia. Yeah, thanks, Manny. Um, I wonder, uh, Sean, you mentioned uh, in your introductory comments about the um, the economic policies of the uh, the opposition um, and the the NUG, and I know um, uh, the it would, yeah, I'd love to hear um, a bit more about that in particular. Um, uh, the sort of I know there's been a need for a lot of creativity, I guess, um, considering the situation. I think that kind of goes to. Um, some of what we've been speaking about already. So, would yeah, love to hear um, your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, Caitlin. So, one of the most pleasurable things in my time in Myanmar from 2016 to 2021 uh, were the young people that I was working with. Um, when, when you go into Myanmar, again, Myanmar then really was in transition and it was moving from this old, rigid state military sort of economy into something else. Um, so it had a lot of these old guys, and I say that deliberately, they were old and they were men, just in control of everything. And they were such a dead weight across the board, everything that we tried to do. And when I say we, I mean Myanmar's reformers, the, the young deputy ministers and so on. Everything that we tried to push through was always blocked and stymied and, you know, they were just a sea anchor basically on everything. The government department by department by department uh, were dominated by, the, by these old men. So the great pleasure was in uh, working alongside young men and women uh, who were really pushing the economy forward. Now, the reason why I mentioned that was a pleasure at that time. But since the coup, these people have, have now uh, invariably the part of the NUG or part of other structures in opposition to the regime. And they're just as clever. I mean, it's not not a surprise. They're just as clever, just as innovative, uh, probably more motivated now than ever. So, yeah, some of the stuff coming out is just fantastic. You know, and I was thinking when we talk about sanctions and all that and against this regime and all that. But the other side of the story, of course, is that, yes, the international community should be sanctioning the regime. But they also should be cooperating much more with genuine non-state actors, but who have a much more legitimate claim, actually, you know, at some point to be the state actors, if you like, for me, and are much more impressive. Um, yeah, so if, if I look at these people who, again, part of the NUG and outside of it, just incredibly impressive, um, who take as just an opening assumption that Myanmar will be a democracy, uh, that the military will have no place in the economy, uh, that Myanmar will be uh, a federal a federal union uh, and a democratic system within that. So, in, in other words, you know, if one was to look at where Myanmar's economy needs to go, it's not about little uh, uh, technical details of monetary policy or banking policy, etc. It's a wholesale politi political economy transformation, but that's there in, in the thinking of these uh, as I say, these young policymakers uh, forced outside Myanmar, mostly some still in, in the country. That's their assumption. And they come up with policies that are consistent with that. Um, again, I mentioned the document that came out yesterday uh, about just some more details about what a federal democratic union would look like. But it certainly comes out in things like banking policy, funding of the government, just, again, an absolute assumption that property rights hold, that the that sound macroeconomic management would be the way that they would proceed, that there would be an end to money printing and all these terrible practices, which unfortunately are now back front and centre under the SAC regime, but that these have no place 
in in an incumbent government. So, um, yeah, I, I look at them. Uh, I see the way that they've benefited from the mistakes that we made. When I say we, again, the sort of reformers in that 2016, 2021 period, they're just so impressive. Um, and, you know, just given the chance, they could really turn things around, in my view. But but I guess the the yeah, final thing to, to just point to is that these are interlocutors that we can deal with. That is the international community. Um, you know, the, there's a positive aspect to the international engagement as well as a negative story of just punishing this regime. Yeah, thanks, Sean. I think that's so important. And um, Taz, I'd love to come to you in a minute to talk about um, the Myanmar campaign network's um, role in that as well. Um, but I just see um, uh, someone's asked in the chat, Sean, um, about uh, um, the difference between well, whether there's a difference, I guess, between the Australian mining companies um, that Taz mentioned that are investing in Myanmar uh, and then the, compared with NGOs that might be investing funds in the economy uh, which could indirectly benefit, um, like coming from a goodwill place. I think, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, whether there's risks involved and how, I guess, how to manage that. Um, sorry, Peter, I was building on that question. I hope that's a good summary. So, so I guess on that, Caitlin, it's just a very simple rule, really, which is: does the, do funds get into the hands of the regime? Uh, and in particular, foreign exchange that they're absolutely desperate for. Um, and there's ways around it, and and people. Uh, who've been involved in Myanmar for many years uh, know those ways. Uh, and if I think the person who's asking the question is is who I think they are, uh, they certainly know how to do, do the ways to help the people of Myanmar under the table, if you like, that doesn't involve uh, foreign exchange flowing to Myanmar's regime. So, yeah, there's a very big role, uh, no doubt, for many of the organisations that are part of Aden. Uh, there are ways that we can do it. Uh, for absolutely for certain. There are people to support outside the country. There are ways that things can be done inside as well. But yeah, I think that just that golden rule. Um, do any financial or other real resources flow to the SAC regime or not? I think that that's the basic question to ask. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so I guess on kind of what we can do from, from Australia and as Australian-based um, organisations, um, Taz, uh, I think it would be great if you could explain a bit um, to those listening about what the Myanmar Campaign Network, I guess, is and, um, yeah, what you've been working on to date. Yeah, of course. Um, so Myanmar Campaign Network, it's a very, very diverse network of um, some incredible organisations. Uh, it formed just after the coup. Um, there's uh, obviously NGOs, INGOs, faith-based organisations, um, human rights organisations, trade unions and Myanmar diaspora organisations. Um, they've done some pretty amazing investigative work um, and uh, have also, you know, we've also um, made sanction submissions. Um, in 2021, um, member organisations uh, submitted FOIs to Future Fund, which found that Australia's sovereign wealth fund um, is actually investing in companies that are in Myanmar's uh, oil and gas sector. Um, and our main calls obviously have been uh, for sanctions uh, and also for recognition of the national unity government, the, the legitimate government of Myanmar. Um, and obviously, you know, it, it, February for this year, um, one year ago, we, you know, we had, you know, some, I don't know, I, you know, it was really strange when we had the sanctions, February 1st, 2023, I thought I would be happy. <laughs> and I, I felt very, um, because we'd been campaigning for two years for this. And I was like, this is, this is an uphill battle. I just didn't know if and when we would achieve that. And I actually felt, I felt very neutral. Um, and I also felt, um, and this kind of goes back to what you said ages ago, Manny, um, I felt that those sanctions last year, even though they were very impactful and very important, um, obviously targeting um, a lot of those uh, top um, military junta um, persons um, and those two uh big military conglomerates, MEC and MEHL, I was like, this is this is five years too late. Sorry. Oops, I'm being I am being very honest today. I feel very comfortable with you guys. Um, you know, it that's retrospective. All of the people who were sanctioned and all of those entities, they should have been sanctioned in, in 2018, 
when we sanctioned those um, five individuals in relation to the Rohingya genocide. Um, I just don't want it to be, sorry, I, I went on a bit of a tangent there. That's what I was saying before. I just don't want it to be five years from now, we're sanctioning um, all of the entities and the individuals that need to be sanctioned uh, now, because this is a really important um, moment in Myanmar's history. We have a situation of leverage, you know, with all of the um, the advances that have been made um, strategically, with the coordination between uh, ethnic uh, resistance organisations and the NUG, uh, the the dissatisfaction, as you said before, Manny, with Min Online and the cannibalisation um, of the SAC, um, you know, uh, imprisoning a couple of key ministers for corruption, which is kind of a joke, really, um, when it's all corrupt. Um, sorry, but going back to what um, MCN does. <laughs> Um, we organise, um, obviously we're doing uh, a lot of uh, advocacy and lobbying, uh, many member organisations and um, individuals uh, are meeting with, uh, you know, members of parliament and ministers to um, give our recommendations and we also obviously have uh, public campaigns as well. Uh, and one of the ones that I probably will mention now is uh, in light of Justice for Myanmar's uh, you know, pretty devastating report about Australian involvement in the mining sector. We do have an email campaign that we've launched today to email uh, Minister Wong to call for sanctions on the entire network of individuals and entities in the mining sector. And obviously beyond that, calling for sanctions on state-owned enterprises. Uh, obviously, today we've had the sanctions on the aviation, a couple of jet fuel suppliers, but also on the entire aviation fuel supply chain. We'd like to see that. Uh, and also on the uh, Union Election Commission, because obviously the junta is planning these illegitimate sham elections. Um, yes, and so we will put the link to the action in the chat, and we would love everyone involved to um, to send an email to Minister Wong. Thanks, Taz. And I feel like um, a lot of people on this call can probably relate to that feeling of when you've campaigned or worked on something for a really long time and that kind of the sense of it's still not being enough, even once you achieve something you've worked on for a really long time, because it is such a huge, um, such, there's such a huge need. Um, and it's, um, I think it ties in nicely. We've had a question in the Q&A um, come through about the, the role of international justice um, processes in this. Um, and so Manny, I'd love to hear from you. Um, they've asked specifically in light of the recent ICJ hearing, what other actions can be taken regarding Myanmar through the international justice system? Um, but I wonder if it might be good as well for you to just maybe explain if you can a bit about the ICJ, um, what, it, what it means, I suppose, um, as well for Myanmar. Sure. Um, so the International Court of Justice, um, there's a case um, there, which is the highest world court um, of Gambia accusing Myanmar of genocide or committing genocide against Rohingya, not just in the uh, ethnic cleansing campaign of 2017, but also prior to that. And um, part of that is also looking into um, you know, the crimes against humanity of apartheid, which um, Human Rights Watch determined uh, in 2020. So um, we've still got that uh, process in the works. It's ongoing, but it is, of course, delayed because of the coup. And uh, I think that actually Myanmar gave its um, counter memorial in August last year. They did make it in time. Um, and this is, you know, counter memorial. It's in response to the accusations that or allegations that um, Gambia has made. Then they have to show certain steps that they're taking to make sure that they're not doing more harm to the Rohingya. So I'm not sure how they will pass that, but it is a very, very difficult, long process that will take years to come to any type of conclusion. And even then, nothing is enforceable. So what we're looking at is, um, you know, other mechanisms in which to hold Myanmar accountable. I'm really interested in one that um, 
sort of came about last year as well. And there's been a lot of discussion about it, actually looking at holding Myanmar accountable at the ILO. So Myanmar is also a signatory to the ILO, and it is a completely separate agency to the UN. Um, and, you know, considering that the ILO also um, had an investigation, um, the second of its kind, finding extreme labor violations, um, this this is something that may be enforceable to holding Myanmar accountable. And it could actually be the thing that brings men online to the dock, actually, because uh, this is something that they care about. They want that foreign exchange and currency in the country. And if it seem if it's deemed that they are in violation of the ILO conventions, then um, it shuts down in it really does cut out a lot of business. This is actually what brought them to the table in the 90s um, in regards to child labor and um, child labor, particularly in the in the military. So there are things that Myanmar does care about. It's it's really up to us to identify what they are. And it comes down to money, um, relationships in Asia. And you know, this China relationship is extremely interesting because. Uh, it, it does appear that they're losing patience. I mean, this whole Northern Alliance offensive in October could only have happened with the full green light from China. Um, so China's hedging its bets on who's going to be taking control of this particular region. And I think that um, they'll go whichever way the wind blows. They don't really care who's in power so long as there's stability so that they can implement the uh, initiatives that they want to. And that's at the bottom dollar on their part as well. Um, but, you know, they are a wily actor. They're selling weapons to all the different parties, um, the illicit trades are going through that border via all the parties. Um, and we need to be a bit more, I think, savvy about the way that we engage with, with um, Chinese companies as well. Um, but back to the question about these international systems, um, I'm, I'm a little bit sad because anything that we look toward is going to be very, very, uh, it will take a really long time. It will be very, very long. Um, and then, you know, when we're thinking even now about transitional justice and where to go from here, um, that's a positive, actually, because we've stopped looking at it just as in how do we stop the attacks, how do we stop the abuses, but now we're looking at it and we're able to think more about what are the solutions, where can we get, how do we get there, Um there's been discussion about um, promoting what could be a special court as well inside Myanmar. So, you know, if we can't get to these um, international mechanisms to hold people accountable um, or they take a very long time, is there a possibility to set up a special court inside the country? But again, that takes a lot of resources and finances um, from governments and from the UN. And may I just say one more thing, sorry, because I it it's something that really annoyed me at a panel last year that I was on at the FCCT in Thailand. Um, someone said, what Myanmar needs is a charismatic leader like Zelensky, and then we'll fix everything, you know? And I just thought, have you, you have just completely missed the whole point of this resistance. It's a groundswell movement from the entire country. There have been, you know, such delightful examples of leadership from all groups, factions, small civil society actors to business community leaders to just, you know, your teacher down the road. And that really, really annoyed me because the point is that MIMA has so much um, capacity to lead themselves and decades of saying where we want to go and how we want to do it. And it, I just feel like no one's listening to that. So um forget the one charismatic leader we have many charismatic leaders and that will get us to the future justice <laughs> <laughs> oh, but um no i couldn't agree more um and before we move off international justice um Annie, just someone's asked a quick follow-up um which is fair enough is how is it that south africa brought the case against israel so quickly when that wasn't the case with the gambia um uh, yeah, I'll throw that to you before we move on. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on the IJ. I, I can actually check to see if you, if you want to know um, the technicalities there. But actually, you know what? Uh, Myanmar's case really set up precedent for South Africa's case. And I know this is controversial, um, but uh, we have the same type of um, simmering factors there, let's say, right? Like we have this apartheid determination. We have ongoing conflict. Um, and I say conflict, but really it is one group that has the massive persuasive arms and impact that, you know, dictates how the others live their life um, and how they don't get to live their life. So actually Myanmar's case being in existence already um, probably helped propel that a bit further because there is precedent and a lot of that language, including the directives uh, to Israel to stop committing abuses against the, the Gazan or Palestinian people, um, it's a very similar language to, to what was used um, in directing Myanmar. Yeah, thank you. Um, just going back to um, what you were saying about the whole grassroots movement um, in Myanmar and how inspiring that's been, um, I think, yeah, I think we'd all agree. Um, and I'd love us to spend a bit of time, I guess, thinking about or talking about, um, yeah, like what comes next, I suppose, and, and sort of how to support that um, more broadly. And Sean, I know you've spoken a bit about the uh, some of the economic nous of the young um, policy thinkers, um, but I guess what would you, since you know the country so intimately, like what would you say are kind of some of the, I guess, the top priorities to kind of, you know, if we're, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but if we're thinking about a kind of um, rebuilding a civilian capability, um, obviously the economy is a huge one, but yeah, I'd love to hear kind of, yeah, some of the priorities from your perspective and maybe the same question to the others afterwards, but yeah, great question, Caitlin. And the problem is fairly obvious and fairly easy, if I can say. I don't mean that the journey will be easy, but but what to do is fairly easy because the main thing is is to uh, stop these war economy policies. So Myanmar's economic policies are overwhelmingly man-made. And, of course, they use the gender specifically there. Um, they're overwhelmingly man-made and they can be overwhelmingly person-stopped. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, so that that's the central fact. Uh, you get that out of the way um, and things start to repair al almost automatically in a sense that the the economy has been driven so low that one of the good things is if we get any sort of half decent government, the bounce back will be quite quick because the economy, as I say, has been just knocked so, so much down. Um, Myanmar, for instance, is the only economy in Southeast Asia that hasn't returned to pre-COVID growth levels. So we're 10%, GDP is 10% below 2019 levels. Just an extraordinary thing, you know, and it took a massive hit, 25% GDP fall in that first uh, first year after the coup, but it basically it hasn't recovered. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, and, and people are so much worse off uh, because of that. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, get, getting things back to uh, back to something is uh, essentially just about reversing that extraction uh, and having the government, just for a start, just not being an extractor, as opposed to even before putting any positive things in, you know, would be a huge change. Um, th there's all sorts of ways I think we can help that process. Um, you know, I've, I've praised already the, the young reformers who are now doing all this stuff. They get no international support, basically, at all. Um, and, and that, in a sense, also, by the way, you know, I, I can praise them. But you might think, oh, well, Sean's always praising them. Uh, in fact, one of the reviews of my book, it said if there was one fault, it said I was too gushing uh, <laughs> in my praise of uh, me and Mars reformers. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to gush again. So uh, I don't mind gushing. Um, but just to say that they, they put their money where their mouth is even now. So as I say, no real financial support for the NUG or the opposition, and yet they fund themselves in all sorts of incredibly in innovative ways from the usual things like lotteries and so on. But I say usual, you still got to do them. They're still mm -hmm. hard to do. Uh, for things like cryptocurrencies, they've got this Spring Development Bank, this development bank that's emerged and has nearly 100,000 customers now. They've got central banks, uh, like a sort of shadow central bank set up. Uh, it's all really good stuff, and um, you know, and then really cheeky, wonderful things like that. That initiative of selling off the properties of Min Ong Lai and some of his uh, gang. I mean, uh, you know, just wonderful stuff, and and with a sort of uh, a true government endorsing, you know, the the property right transfer and mm -hmm. things like that. 
uh, it's just re- just you know again very innovative, um, very bold sort of stuff. So, but yeah, in, in the longer term, turning things around, I think is pretty straightforward. Um, one of the good things is um, a lot of the planning on that was done before uh, because of COVID and all that. There was some very detailed plans of economic recovery written in about twenty uh, late twenty twenty early twenty twenty one. But again, these these young reformers have taken those and they've extended it to, in better ways anyway. So yeah, on that front, yeah, give them a go, and um, <laughs> we'll see what me and Mark can do. <laughs> I love that. Um, uh, Taz, uh, I guess, yeah, same question to you. Like when you think about, um, I guess, rebuilding sort of future Myanmar and what would some of the priorities from your perspective be to that kind of journey? Sure. Um, I would um, I would take it from the perspective of, you know, what can the Australian government be doing uh, in terms of their humanitarian aid and development? Um, and I had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Tonal Shui, who's the energy representative to Australia. Um, and he was talking about how Australia should be planning uh, in accordance to or, um, uh, yeah, in accordance to uh, the energy's 12 uh, step roadmap, which sees this particular stage, the revolution stage, as an interim stage and how it, it has particular needs in terms of its humanitarian needs and other needs. Uh, and then moving on to like a transitional stage. Uh, and he said that right now, obviously, uh, the humanitarian issues uh, are very pressing. So it's all about, you know, health, medicine, vaccines. Um, obviously, uh, education is, uh, it, it, particularly in those areas outside of Punta Control, um, the, the need is for secure communication as well. Um, and that's also a, a cross-cutting uh, uh you know, issue right now or a cross-cutting need right now uh, with health for telemedicine and stuff like that. Because obviously in in uh, Myanmar, the, the junta, um, they do have control uh, over the internet. And we've seen this just recently. Um, there's been massive shut, internet shutdowns in Rakhine State when, you know, obviously there's so much um, uh, atrocities and bombing that are happening that we probably won't really uh, understand until uh, much later. So... Yes, so he was talking about yeah, now's the interim stage, but we also need to be planning towards the um, the transitional phase where the needs are going to be different. And so obviously um, that will be where you'll be looking at rehabilitation, rehabilitation of um, obviously of people who have been injured, but also for those PDF fighters who and, and other fighters who are going to be trying to re- reintegrate into society uh, and will be traumatised. Um, obviously, now the junta has their uh, scorched earth policy, so it's about rebuilding that infrastructure as well in terms of health and education. Um, and in terms of education, we've got a generation of um, children and students who, um, you know, have have been denied education or have had their in- education, um, you know, stimmied somewhat, um, both by COVID and, and by this conflict. Um, so obviously there's going to be a need to be planning towards um, early childhood care and development, vocational training, um, open university, that sort of thing. Um, and actually that ties in with something that I did want to mention, which was um, how Australia is uh, is distributing it, its aid in Myanmar. Uh, last year there was a Senate inquiry into the efficiency of DFAT's due diligence uh, uh, framework, which kind of looks at how uh, DFAT chooses its partners in Myanmar. And currently, uh, d- the majority of DFAT's uh, funding is going to the UN and the Red Cross. Uh, unfortunately, the junta is, uh, you know, it only controls maybe 15 to 20% of the territory, perhaps even less now, uh, and actively denies aid to 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 areas. And that's, that's one of their... Um, one of their, uh, the things that they do. I'm so sorry. My <laughs> my vocabulary is getting less and less as we're having this conversation. Um, so what, one of the one of the things that this uh, <laughs> this uh, in, uh, inquiry was looking at is, um, you know, is DFAT's framework is it fit for purpose in Myanmar, given that it is a contested environment. Um, and the inquiry came back with four recommendations and um, MCN also submitted to this as it did a number of um, organisations. Um, and the 
inquiry recommended that DFAT be looking outside those major partners um, and then looking at uh, civil society organisations, looking towards the NUG. Um, and these are uh, organisations that have decades of experience. They have the trust of the communities uh, and um, you, they have uh, the, the ability to reach people who are actually in need. Uh, another suggestion was to use the extensive church networks in Myanmar to distribute that aid, which is also a fantastic and, and very practical idea. Um, so, yes, I guess basically my point is, yes, Myanmar, we should be looking towards Myanmar's future and we should be adjusting our policies and practices uh, towards that future, not towards the, the business as usual. And also just on that, um, mm -hmm. uh, just to back up, Taz's point, right? That we we don't need to look to the usual actors. Yeah, there's the, I and mean, there are emerging actors, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, and, and there are people there who are much more reliable partners than some of the traditional ones that we might mention. You know, so I think Taz, your thing about the churches and so on, but there's all sorts of groups around the NUG, but again, not not just them. There's there's you know reputable actors that would be much better for a country like Australia to deal with than, than anyone, you know, remotely sanctioned by which I mean endorsed by the SAC regime. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and somehow we've, we're fast running out of time. We're down to our final sort of four minutes. Um, so I, yeah, I guess I might go to everybody for any final, um, final either overall reflections or any anything that you've been burning to say um, that you haven't had a chance to yet in response to any of the questions. Um, so maybe Manny, I might start with you. Oh, bad pick, Caitlin. I'm going to pick a fight with Sean. <laughs> Great. Go for it. Um, <laughs> no, no. First of all, I just want to have some sobering data, which is that, you know, we do have uh, more than 18 million people in uh, need of immediate aid. And, um, you know, this is like almost Australia's population. So this is how we should be framing when we're thinking about what it means when we're talking about the desperateness of the situation. Um, on top of that, you know, the country is very fertile and um, resource rich, and it's just inexcusable that only a third of people are getting any type of uh, livelihood or, you know, satisfactory nutrition at the moment. Um, but yes, Sean, fighting words. So I'm really glad you raised uh, the NUG because, you know, here is me who returned back to my homeland uh, during the peak years, I would say, before and after. Um, and, you know, I've been really, really heartened to see the um, creativity and the energy with which the NUG has been putting into place some of these policies and, and their actions. Um, but I, I do worry sometimes that there's this tendency to go back to what has stayed, um, you know, these traditional sort of political policies that really, I, I don't know who they benefit. Um, and I know that there's obviously a lot of work to be done in terms of um, smoothing out and being a bit more sophisticated. But I would really, really love to see more robust action once we have our country back, um, more diversity, and certainly to make it easier for people who have Burmese backgrounds, who have lived abroad, who have the skills to return um, and train up people, just making it easier for people like me to come back. That's a purely selfish request. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, you know, one of the things that was really difficult as an international person and as a local person was bridging the gaps between um, what where Myanmar should be in comparison to the rest of the world. And one of the hardest questions I found myself being asked whenever I was back in the country was, what's it like overseas? Um, how is it different to Myanmar? <laughs> and I just would always be tongue-tied with how to explain that situation. So I hope that we can get to a better point. Yeah, uh, it was a great point. And, it, and, and it's something that I observed at the time as well. Um, so, you know, I mentioned the old men that tended to dominate things and so on, which is to your point, actually, about the lack of diversity, et cetera. And, and I guess that that's why I'm somewhat heartened by the, the real emphasis on things like federalism and all that. So, and as we know, when we talk about diversity, 
the multiple facets, right? It's it's gender. It's to do with, uh, you know, above all, how, how do we incorporate Myanmar's ethnic groups together, and and you know, to end this dominance of the Burma and and all that. So, um, yeah. So I mean, it seems to be certainly in place in there. But but I understand where you're coming from. I think some friends of mine in your sort of position, uh, Myanmar people overseas coming back, uh, that, that sort of very much sense of being excluded at times. Uh, of course, th this is a bigger issue, though, isn't it? Because um, there's always that tension, right, to the people who've been overseas and the people who remain and all that. And, and that's difficult to get around. I would imagine that after all of this, there will still be a bit of that as well. And, and that will be a challenge, I guess, to uh, whatever government or uh, emerges after all this. Um, hopefully, though, this has been a shock to the system. I, I just get a feeling that amongst really good people who might have been a little bit more complacent about these sorts of issues when the NLD came into government, saw them as perhaps secondary issues. Uh, in favour of just getting on top of the economy and things like that, maybe they'll be a little bit more front and centre now, given given what happened. Um, I, I don't want to be too Pollyanna-ish. I have a tendency to this. Oh, I, end, I but, totally get yeah, No, but, no, I agree. And yeah. I mean, there, there, there are so many um, immediate concerns, but I that's what I think is um, they used to get pushed back, like, you know, women's rights mm. will we'll, Look at right. women's rights when we have stability in the country. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, access to certain privileges, like that's that sort of thing. So I just want to make yeah. sure that you know we are considering every facet um, when we're thinking about this whole structure of federalism yeah. as well, because it does go f much further into that. That might be another conversation yeah. to have, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's but, interesting though, um, many because it seems to me that amongst those young people that I mentioned who I find so impressive, there's a definite generational change, I think, over issues Definitely. like gender and ethnicity and so on. They're, they're, we're different. They're different people now. I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks, everyone. I'm sorry to cut us off, but we've already gone over time. I feel like this conversation could have gone on much longer. It was fascinating. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there for now. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Sean, Taz and Manny um, for your time today, your wisdom, insights. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Sorry to those whose questions we didn't quite get to, but hopefully we answered a lot of them. Um, and yeah, um, look forward to seeing everybody um, again soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you.